Hi there, I'd like to welcome Melchior. He's a consulting engineer at uh, Juniper Networks, and he will talk about demystifying quantum key distribution. Um, in his presentation, he will explore how quantum key distribution works and how it can be leveraged in existing security mechanisms. He will also explain some of the terminology, principles, and what a quantum internet is. If you have any questions, please ask them via the question option on the live stage, and I will bring them at the end to Mecho. So Mecho, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for having me, uh, the Enoch. Uh, compliments for the waiting music. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Melchior. I work with uh, Juniper as a consulting engineer, and I'm part of a, a study group in uh, Juniper that's looking into how we can make uh, quantum applicable to networking. Um, and I figured I, um, uh, as, as a learning exercise for myself as well, I figured I uh, uh, tell you something about it give you a little introduction into quantum uh, and what it is. Um, so, uh, and we'll also talk about one of the, uh, let's say most applicable or most realistic applications currently for quantum that is uh, quantum key distribution. So we'll look at how it works and um, how to make it applicable and, and how to uh, leverage it in, um, for example, MagSec and IPsec. Um, but before uh, we do that, we first need to understand some of the uh, terminology and what is so unique about quantum uh, and, and why it could be interesting for us to look into. Um, a small disclaimer, I am not a physicist. Uh, I haven't studied uh, physics as well, um, so I will only scratch uh, the surface. Um, so uh, to just get some uh, baselining um, uh, on many of the slides, there are links to uh, uh, reading uh, more information, whether it's Wikipedia or YouTube, etc. So I highly recommend if you're interested in the subject to um, look those up as well. Um, so there's basically three fields um, of quantum that are of interest uh, to us as uh, network engineers. Um, the first uh, a uh, quantum uh, random number generates a using a or a router or uh, on a server that uses quantum uh, aspects or uh, quantum properties to generate um, uh, to generate randomness basically, and that randomness you can then use in uh, uRandom or random, for example, on uh, Linux. Um, why we want to discuss the uh, random is much much higher than you can. Get uh, random, for example. Um, so the second field of interest is um, using uh, quantum uh, properties to uh, distribute data. In this case, it's uh, distributing key material, um, but going forward in the future, you can imagine um, that it's probably possible to also send real data uh, using uh, polarized photons. Uh, I'll get to what a polarized photon is. Industry. Of interest was quantum cryptography um, that built this um, uh, security protocols and mechanism resents the text from uh, quantum computers. Um, as you probably have heard by now, once we uh, really see quantum computers happening in large scale, then um, uh, many of the security algorithms we're using are uh, vulnerable to that. Um, so that immediately leads me to the uh, problem statement. Um, what is actually the uh, issue or the problem we're trying to solve with uh, quantum key distribution? Um, many of the protocols like MagSec um, uh, to secure links between uh, network equipment are using AES-256 um, to encrypt um, that data traffic. And AES-256 in itself is pretty resistant or expected to be resistant against attacks from uh, quantum computers. Um, and the thing is that if at one point a quantum computer is able to actually factor that key, then you simply uh, double the key size and you're good for 
another couple of years. Um, the issue is in the way you um, distribute the keys between uh, the different uh, routers or different uh, endpoints. Um, it is described uh, as Shure's algorithm, which is a algorithm that can run on a quantum computer. Um, and that basically is really good in factoring prime numbers. As you might recall, uh, many of the security uh, protocols we're using are based on uh, prime numbers. And obviously multiplying prime numbers is pretty easy, but factoring prime numbers is really hard, especially for a, as the physicists refer to, a classical computer, or in other words, the computers we are using. Um, and it is expected that at one point a quantum computer becomes powerful enough to run this uh, Shor's algorithm. And keep uh, part vulnerable those algorithms. Um, so we need to come up with a different way of distributing that key material. Um, but before we go into that, what is it and what isn't it? I mentioned already quantum computers and uh, uh, some uh, aspects like photons. Um, everything we are discussing uh, today in this presentation has nothing to do with quantum computers. Um, so um, if you would want to start using quantum key distribution, you don't need a quantum computer. The only thing we're using is an aspect uh, or some of the... So we're in position uh, and we are transporting that to uh, another device, um, but we're not using quantum computers itself. So we don't need all the high uh, cooling and uh, so with quantum or um, whatever spooky, uh, again, quantum aspects to uh, transport key material. Um, and um, so that is uh, to, to set some uh, perspective. So let's look at what it is actually that, that quantum um, being a classical bit, we currently know them, that is zero state. Um, in quantum, we're using qubits, and uh, a qubit or quantum bit can be zero and one, just as the classical bit, but also everything in between. Um, and that everything in between, that is what is called the superposition. Um, in, in this case, we're using photons. You can also uh, use electrons. That's a, a different way of uh, building uh, or, or using quantum aspects. Um, but we're using photons. So what you do, in, again, in very um, basic uh, terms, you uh, take a photon, uh, you uh, take a laser, and you put the photon into a sort of superposition. In other words, you give it a spin, as they call it. Um, and um, the way uh, you spin it, you can do that in, in several positions. Um, for QKD, um, those positions are either 0, 45, 90, uh, 135 degrees. Um, a few slides uh, uh, down this presentation, we'll look at why uh, those are in, uh, interesting and, and what you can do with those superpositions. Um, probably the most interesting aspect of a qubit is that you cannot copy it, um, where obviously a classical bit you can copy, uh, even a photon carrying uh, information in a classical system, you can amplify in a CWDM or DWDM system. Um, in quantum, you cannot do that. So obviously for security um, uh, or, or if you're using qubits or quantum in security, that's a big plus. The downside is, as I mentioned, you cannot use it in CWDM or DWDM. Um, so the practical distance of a, uh, in this case, QKD solution is limited to around 120, 160 kilometers, um, which uh, could be uh, perfectly fine if your data centers are close to each other, but if you're 200 or 400 or even further kilometers away, that could become a problem. Um, there is a solution that is not using uh, fiber, but that is using free space. In other words, using satellites. And obviously in that case, you can spend much uh, bigger distances. However, then you would need satellite receivers and a satellite um, being up in the sky. So 
um, there's, there's pros and cons. Um, the copying of a qubit um, is something the physicists are working on. In other words, they are trying to build a quantum repeater, which is basically what we know as an amplifier in, again, um, an, an optical system. Um, but they're not there uh, yet. Um, as I mentioned, superposition, um, I already described uh, most of it, but um, the superposition can be uh, compared as uh, in, an, uh, in what we're hearing uh, in, a daily, uh, in our daily lives. If you listen to music, for example, what you hear is always a combination of multiple audio waves. And uh, you could sort of compare a superposition to that. So as I mentioned, a qubit can be a zero and a one, uh, or sorry, or one, and they can be a zero and a one at the same time or anything in between. Um, the interesting thing is you only know what a superposition it had if you measure it. So if you observe the photon and you measure it, uh, then it will collapse in either zero or one state. Um, so, um, uh, again, this is just uh, scratching the surface. Uh, there's a link uh, down here to, to read further. Uh, just explaining what a superposition is could uh, uh, be a class of, of a couple of hours, probably. Um, but one of the things you can do with, bring, with those photons in superposition is to um, transport uh, information to the other side. Or um, if you, there's a mechanism that's called entanglement. Um, in that case, you bring two photons really close together. Um, uh, that is already possible uh, in the laboratories of the universities, for example. Um, if you bring them really close together, they sort of copy the state of the other photon. And then if you take them apart and you measure photon on one side, the other side will collapse into exactly the same state. So if you measure uh, on the left side, uh, that it's a one, then the other photon will always collapse into a one as well. Um, and that is called teleportation. So although in, in movies teleportation is referred to uh, transporting physical objects, that is not possible yet. Um, but uh, you can transfer information by using those uh, aspects. Um, I already touched on some of the uh, advantage and challenges of quantum. Again, obviously, an advantage is the, the no cloning uh, principle. So you cannot copy a photo. It means that if the other side receives the 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 the, the Bob side receives a photon that Alice has sent, then um, it can only be unique. Else, the superposition would have already been collapsed. And then, if you measure it, there is no uh, quantum state to measure anymore. Um, if you're using this in uh, security then uh, you are using physics over math. So instead of uh, calculating a long key with a prime number, et cetera, um, that is always a risk because if you can calculate something, there's always someone else with a bigger or faster computer that can also uh, calculate that. Um, physics, you cannot calculate, obviously. Um, we'll get to how we leverage that exactly, but um, you can imagine that uh, if you cannot calculate it, it's much harder to uh, interfere or eavesdrop. I also mentioned some of the challenges already. Um, uh, three of the biggest challenges are uh, decoherence. In other words, um, how long can a, a photon uh, be in that superposition? Um, that is uh, something um, the physicists are working on as well currently. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure on the, on the exact current state, but uh, a photon can keep its, its superposition for a couple of minutes currently. Um, so you can imagine that um, it's really hard. Um, so currently, it's only usable for real-time applications. Um, the other thing is fidelity. Fidelity is basically um, the, um, the quality of the qubit itself. In other words, um, if you, as I mentioned, uh, measure or observe the photon at one side, the other side collapses into the same position. That is in theory always true. In practice, that is not always true. Um, and um, in many cases, even it's not always true. 
Um, so um, the lower the fidelity is obviously the less reliable um, the information and uh, the entanglement is. Um, so obviously, uh, if you want to uh, use this in a, a large scale system or transporting more data, then the fidelity needs to go up as well. Um, and scaling is an issue um, because um, the rate of transporting data currently is comparable uh, to when we were using uh, dial-up modems um, to connect to what was then referred to as the internet or um, or a bulletin board system. Um, so this, the, the speed is still really slow. Um, and um, <clears throat> that entanglement I mentioned, currently you can only entangle two photons. Um, so if you want to obviously scale this out or do this in a multi-point fashion, then you would need to be able to scale uh, much more, uh, wider and further. Um, so let's look at some of the terminology you might have heard in, in the media or have read about uh, quantum networking and quantum internet. Um, there is no quantum internet yet. Um, sorry to say, but um, what there currently is, is a quantum network. And that is most comparable as to a peer-to-peer -to -peer network where two hosts uh, connect to each other using a dark fiber, or as I mentioned, the satellite, and are able to send a few photons um, from one side to the other that are in a superposition. Um, obviously, the distance I mentioned, the 120 kilometers, is an issue as well um, that we need to overcome. Um, so there are some working theories and, and, and physicists are working on in the labs of how to actually go, go for, from a quantum network to a quantum internet. Um, one idea is uh, to use something that is called an entanglement swap, where Alice and Bob entangle a photon and Bob and Charlie entangle photons, and then Bob does a so-called swap action. Um, and by doing so, Alice and Charlie will have a uh, entangled photon. Um, this is somewhat comparable to, for example, how MPLS work, or at least overlay uh, networking, where you uh, build an overlay network over several hops. Um, but this is pretty much uh, only in theory um, currently there. Um, so for now, a quantum network or quantum internet will look a bit like uh, this picture, where end nodes will always still have a classical link. Um, the physicists all refer to whatever we're doing as being classical. So uh, classical networking is the way uh, we know uh, networking. Um, so an end node will have a classical link and a, um, a dark fiber or a quantum link. Um, there are ideas and, and some companies are working on combining those on the same fiber, but um, that is still not really um, there in practice. Um, so some applications where you could use a quantum in networking is obviously if you need exact states at the same time at different places, in other words, for uh, clock synchronization, uh, access to resources, uh, telescope baselining, uh, obviously in the future communication between quantum computers and sharing memory in quantum computers. Um, but the only application that is really currently here and available, there's commercial parties building these QKD applications and boxes. Um, so that is, that is uh, uh, mainly because the fidelity uh, is high enough and uh, QKD doesn't need that much uh, bandwidth. So let's how that uh, quantum key distribution actually works and uh, repeat why we uh, would need that. Um, as I mentioned in public key cryptography, um, the mechanisms Ellis and Bob are using to uh, send data and encrypt data in between each other are pretty good. Um, the issue is how to share that key, right? In, Many um, situations were still using email or you could use uh, snail mail or fax or whatever, SMS, WhatsApp um, to distribute that key, but that is not really secure. Uh, and the protocols we've developed to do that, uh, Diffie-Hellman, for example, are vulnerable to attacks from quantum computers. Um, so the only way, uh, the only security protocols that are safe are those based on symmetric key, key cryptography where Alice and Bob know the key um, but they do not have to share the key with each other because they already knew it. Then the only thing we need to fix is how are Alice and Bob going to communicate that key? Um, so in, in, in other words, um, if you look at the right side, the uh, symmetric uh, 
cryptography we're using based on AES is quantum safe or expected to be quantum safe. However, what you see on the left side, the uh, public key cryptography uh, algorithms we're using, uh, like say, separable to quantum computers. So now use quantum aspect property in uh, QK use the keys you communicate with the system in the, for example, in MacSec or IPSec, um, or even what I talked about um, <clears throat> a couple of DNOs ago, uh, TCP AO, for example. Uh, basically, using uh, QKD. I already mentioned how um, something like that should work. Um, and there's two gentlemen, Bennett and Brassard, who came up with a, a protocol and a way how uh, you can use those quantum aspects to uh, distribute those keys uh, between two nodes. They did that in 1984, hence the protocol is called BV84. Um, so imagine you have two hosts, Alice and Bob, um, and in uh, QKD, it's always Alice sending uh, photons to Bob. So Alice has a laser polarizing photons and Bob has a photon detector that can uh, detect the uh, superposition of a photon. So there we go. Um, Alice is sending polar, starts sending polarized photons to Bob. Uh, and as you can see, the arrows are indicating the uh, quantum position of those uh, or the quantum state of those photons. In other words, zero degrees, 45 degrees, 135 degrees, uh, 45 degrees again, 135, etc. cetera. Um, they, she uses a quantum channel to do that, which is basically a dark fiber. As I mentioned, you cannot, um, uh, in, in current uh, state, you cannot amplify that. So it's a dark fiber between the, the box on Alice's side and Bob, uh, the uh, box on, on Bob's side. Uh, and Bob receives those photons um, and has, as I mentioned, the photon detector, so he can uh, measure the states of the photons as he does, and he stores that information. Then, because Bob doesn't know um, upfront uh, which polarization Alice used to send the photon, he's applying random filters to the information he receives. And the random filter will either pass zero or 90 degrees, or 45 and 135 degrees polarized photons, as you can see the cross and the and the and the plus, uh, sorry the yeah the cross and the plus signal. Um, Alice will do the same, um, and then if you go through that, um, some measurements will pass the filter, and some will give an error. Right, if you try to push a 45 degree polarized photon through a zero or 45 degree uh, polar uh, filter. Uh, then obviously your measurement is false. Um, as you can see in the first measurement on Alice's side, successfully passes. Um, the second, she's trying to push the 45 degree polarized photon through a zero or 90 degree filter. And then obviously you will get an error rate uh, or sorry, an error reading. Um, Bob does the same. So some photons will successfully pass and some uh, will error. Now, if both share the filters they've used and you can use a public data channel because the filter you still don't know um, and they so they exchange those uh, filters and now if they overlay the filters you see that in some cases you will get a valid result and in some cases you will get a false result uh, out of that measurement now if you sift through the results you see um, that some uh, the, 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 the photons that pass the filter will um, carry information, in this case, 0, 1, 0, 1. And obviously, then uh, that results in your shared key. The reason why this is so secure, that if you would have an eavesdropper on the quantum channel, um, that will need to apply the same uh, filters. But obviously, the eavesdropper doesn't know which filters uh, Bob and Alice have used. Um, so you can sift through, uh, you can filter the results and you get outcomes. But as you can see, Alice and Bob also received outcomes from uh, error measurements. Um, so an eavesdropper has no idea which measurements are actually true. Then you would also need, obviously, the filters Alice and Bob have used. Um, so this is uh, considered pretty secure. There's there's alternatives to this protocol as well, and there's, there's newer protocols, but this is the, the basics of 
how to use those quantum aspects to um, carry key information between uh, two nodes. Um, <clears throat> so now, how are we going to use that? Our Alice and Bob routers are still using our AES 250 phase protocol uh, to encrypt the data, but the way they receive the keys is different. Um, so they're not using Diffie-Hellman or RSA or any other uh, 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 key distribution mechanism. They are getting keys from a QKD device. And the way they fetch those keys is by uh, leveraging a protocol that is defined by Etsy, which is called Etsy, uh, the, the Etsy QKD REST API. And you can basically uh, pull that and request key material. So then how it works. Uh, as I mentioned, Alice and Bob both have a QKD device. Alice, her device is sending photons. Bob, his device is measuring the photons. And uh, obviously, they both all have they, they both have a router on site as well. And between those devices, there's three channels. Um, two channels are used for the QKD devices. One is the dark fiber, the quantum channel, and the other is the data communication channel that they use to exchange um, those uh, filters. Uh, and the third channel is between the routers, which is a, a, just an, an Ethernet link, which is secured by MagSec or IPsec, um, or could be, as I mentioned, the BGP session uh, authenticated by TCP AO that is leveraging that key material as well. Now, our LS router wants to get a key. As I mentioned, the Etsy REST API is defined for that. So she sends a request to LSQKD, and LSQKD sends back a key, th a key and a key ID. Um, Alice installs the key in whatever protocol she has, the key tuple or key or whatever. She sends the key ID unencrypted to Bob, um, because with the key ID you cannot really do anything. Um, Bob then uses that key ID to request the same key, uh, or hopefully the same key, obviously from Bob. Key back. Uh, Bob Router can uh, use those keys in again, MagSec, IPsec, or any other protocol. Um, there's a couple of have already done some proof of thing. Um, so ask your favorite networking vendor. They're probably working on this already. Uh, on some tests also with uh, with some uh, uh, telcos. Um, who are interested in this, either securing their own lines or offering this to their customers. Um, and I'm pretty sure other uh, vendors are looking into this as well. Um, so how is this applicable? As I mentioned, um, these solutions are available. There's, for example, ID Quantique, there is uh, KeyQuant, there is uh, Arkit, there's many um, vendors working on this, uh, working on not KQD with QKD. I see now that I misspelled on my slide. Um, but so you can get systems from them um, uh, and you can start using those keys in, in any uh, symmetric key algorithm or protocol or whatever, like MagSec, IPsec, TCPAO, etc. Um, the keys are made available, as I mentioned, using a uh, by Etsy defined REST API. There is quite some um, emulators and simulators. Uh, on the internet as well. So if you want to start playing with it, you can uh, download a simulator that exposes the REST API. Obviously, you won't get um, uh, quantum generated or quantum distributed keys, but you can get a feeling of how it works. Um, and then the question, what's next? Um, there's quite a few challenges uh, to overcome. As I mentioned, the 120 kilometer distance, for example, um, quantum repeaters, uh, can you use, for example, SD-WAN based on a post-quantum um, uh, post quantum security protocol? Uh, should it be satellites? How to uh, also use those keys in locations where you do not have QKD boxes present? Uh, for example, for remote workers or home workers. Um, what about multipoint uh, VPNs, for example? Um, there's quite some challenges, but um, the first steps are here. And I think in, in the next five years, we'll probably uh, see much more of this. Um, we'll probably see much more applications as well. Um, but I hope you have a sort of an idea now of, of what is coming. Um, if you're interested, as I mentioned, there's quite a few links on the slides. Uh, here's a couple of links as well. Um, there's some work in IETF in the Quantum Internet Research Group 
Um, other standards bodies like ITU, Etsy are working on it as well. Um, so there's quite some really good material also on YouTube to find, for example, as well. Um, if you have any questions, I can take them now if time permits, or else uh, feel free to uh, find me on email um, or LinkedIn or Twitter, etc. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel, thank you very much for that um, uh, talk. We are a little bit over time, but I would like to ask two Sorry. questions from the uh, chat anyway. No, not a problem. Um, one question was, um, could you please elaborate on uh, partially leveraging X uh, DWM. Yeah, so what you can do is using uh, 1510 or what is it, 13 something, the, the other channel that is uh, used in, uh, uh, in, 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 let's say, gray uh, DWDM systems. Um, in that case, you can combine unlimited scale uh, with other light sources. Um, but the thing is that um, your distance will be much uh, low of goes down uh, a lot as well because of interference. Um, so yes, in limited skill, you can do QKD over uh, CWDM, DWDM, but um, you will run into uh, other issues. Um, okay, um, uh, thank you for that answer. And uh, another question would be, what is the maximum throughput available with quantum transmission channels? can reach 100k or 100 megabits or 100 gigabits or so just as an, you know, an idea. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure about the, the exact number, but uh, keep in mind, as I mentioned, we are with this at a state where you could com compare it with your dial-up modem. Um, so do not expect to send any pictures or even stream uh, the EMOC over uh, a quantum infrastructure now. Um, uh, but probably that is going to happen, obviously, uh, in the future. But currently, it's a few kilo, if I'm correct. Okay. And are there any real-life production networks right now using it already? Um, I am. Oh, I can obviously not speak for the computers. They will claim that there's uh, production networks. Um, what I've been involved in is main uh, POCs with uh, uh, telecoms, uh, so telecom providers, uh, and some of the cloud providers, um, but those were all in uh, POC. Okay, thank you very much for all of that insights. Um, there were some little more questions. If you want, you can follow up in in an um, extra channel on the left side on about that uh, talk with the audience, and. Um, for, all, for the audience, um, you can either uh, follow up in the uh, side channel or um, wait for the next talk on the main stage. So thank you very much, Melchior, and all to you. Have a nice day. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.